Hello everyone, welcome back to the Coding Game channel. Today's video is about uh, dynamic programming. I'll explain what this is and then we'll solve a coding game problem using this technique. Dynamic programming, also known as DP, is an algorithmic method that can be used to solve some classes of problems very efficiently. It's based on the fact that sometimes you can solve a problem by combining the solution to several smaller problems, and those problems can then be solved using even smaller sub-problems, and so on and so on, until those sub-problems are so small that they are trivial to solve. One famous example of dynamic programming is found when you're computing a given term of of the Fibonacci sequence. So let's say I want to compute the 1000th term of this sequence. The most intuitive way for any developer to solve this problem would probably be to compute the terms in ascending order. So uh, let's start by initializing uh, the array of terms. And then while we have less than um, that amount of terms that we need. Uh, we'll compute a new one. So we'll just happen the sum of um, the last two elements of the array and we'll return the last term. So this code should run, yes, and it's giving me uh, quite a large result actually, but it's because the Fibonacci sequence is exponential. So that's the 1000th term of the Fibonacci sequence right here. So that was one form of dynamic programming called bottom up where you progressively build solutions to larger and larger problems. So you build the solution for n equals one, then two, then three, and so on. But to really demonstrate what DP is about, this problem can also be expressed in top-down form. So those two forms are actually equivalent in terms of operations and complexity, but they will build their answer differently. So now let's see how top-down DP works for the Fibonacci sequence. Here, we still want to compute the 1000th term, but we're gonna first study how to compute that term instead of the first one like we did before. So term n is actually a compound of terms n minus 1 and n minus 2. We'll do a recursive call to compute those two and add them together. So a return like this. As you can see, we're combining the solution of two subproblems to build the answer. If we do like this, you can see that we'll have an infinite number of recursive calls. So we have to specify a stopping condition. As I was mentioning earlier, we can continue the recursive calls until the subproblems are trivial to solve. So we'll just add a condition for uh, terms 1 and 2, so n less or equals than 2. Uh, we'll just return 1 in that case. If we try to run that code, we'll also run into another issue. To see that, let's run it with n equals 6, for example, and log all the function calls. As you can see here, the function will be called many times with the same parameters, and so it will perform the same computation many times. We can improve the performance of uh, this algorithm exponentially by taking into account the fact that two calls with the same inputs will always return the same output. So we can add a caching layer here. In Python, it's with func tools. So uh, using func tools cache, we can add a caching layer to memoize previous results and return the answer immediately if it's known, instead of making the two recursive calls again, which would in turn have two function calls each and so on. Let's now run this code with uh, n equals 1000 as planned. And as we can see, it's returning the same result as the bottom-up approach. Whether you use top-down or bottom-up is uh, really a matter of preference. Personally, I use bottom-up more often since Python doesn't like too many recursive calls and that's my main language. But top-down can also be more uh, intuitive, especially for beginners. So now let's take a more advanced example that we can solve using dynamic programming. In this coding game puzzle called the resistance, we are given a string of Morse code where all the separators between letters and words have been removed and given a dictionary of allowed words, we want to know how many possible decodings would exist for this string. We should note that this number can grow exponentially with the size of the string, so we can't afford to generate all the combinations. We only want to know how many there are. To solve this efficiently, with dynamic programming, we have to find a way to break down such a problem into smaller sub-problems, then combine their answers to build the solution.
solution. Let's first take a simple example from this problem where the allowed words are uh, just a few letters of the alphabet and the string we want to decode is in white, it's dot dash dot dot. We have seven possible decodings for this string which are ed, eti, ete, -E, re, ai, aee -E, and l. Those are the seven decodings and so our algorithm should hopefully return seven. In bottom up dp, the solution starts by solving the most simple sub problem. Here that sub problem is the empty string which has only one way of being decoded is when the input string is empty as well. We will then need to compute the number of possible decodings for the first character of the string then for the first two characters, then the first three, and so on and so on, until we reach the solution which corresponds to the entire string. We can also notice that a decoding for a given string can always be built by taking a valid decoding from a smaller string, then adding a word from our dictionary. That will be the principle of our DP solution. In order to build a decoding for the prefix of length one, which is the dot, we will have to start with a smaller sub problem so here it will be the empty string and then we can add a word from our dictionary here we can add e which is a single dot to build the decoding. So here we start at length zero and add an E to go to length one. So we'll have a single decoding for this prefix. So we will have for prefix dot a single decoding as well. For the decoding of the prefix of length two, which is the dot dash, we can either take a decoding of the empty string and add the dot dash word, which is the A, or we can start from an existing decoding of the prefix of length one and add the character that corresponds to the dash to obtain a decoding of the first two characters. So for the dot dash prefix, we will have one way that comes from the empty string, one way that comes from the dot. So in total, we will have two ways of decoding that prefix. For the prefix of length three, which is the first three characters, it starts to get interesting. Possible decodings either come from adding an to the empty prefix or we can also take any of the two possibilities we have of decoding the dot dash and add an e after that. So in total for this prefix we will have three possibilities. You can also notice that for this prefix we could use a decoding for dot then add a word corresponding to dash dot but we don't have such a word in our list so we cannot count them in the decoding for dot dash dot. With the prefix of length four which actually corresponds to the string we want to process. We can now compute the number of unique decodings. The first possibility for this decoding is obtained by taking the single possible decoding for the empty string and then adding an L which corresponds to this. Then we could also take the single possible decoding for dot and add D which gives us another possibility. For the sub problem of size two, remember that we had two ways of decoding the dot dash here. So we can add an i to this and this gives us two more possibilities of decoding the string of length four. And finally we can take any of the three possible decodings we have for this string and add an e which gives us three more possibilities. So in total for this string of length four which is the one we're looking for we will have seven possibilities in total. One plus one plus two plus three. As you can see using dp we have uh, successfully computed the number of decodings for every prefix of the provided string, including the provided string. And so now we can simply return the result corresponding to this one. So now let's take a shot at implementing this algorithm. First, I'll start with parsing the inputs. Here I have no use of keeping the words as they are given in plain text, so I'll directly encode them in Morse. I'll implement a simple utility function using an encoding table and a join to encode a single word and so I'll keep in the words array the list of Morse encoded words that are allowed in the dictionary. Then we will create array dp which contains at index i the number of possibilities to decode the prefix of length i. We start with zero possibilities everywhere except for index zero which is the empty string which has a single encoding. After that as we did on paper we'll iterate over all prefixes in ascending length and also for each prefix we'll iterate over all of its smaller prefixes and see whether there's a word that could fit in the gap 
between that smaller prefix and the one we're looking at. So in that nested loop, where we check for every length of prefix in ascending order and for every gap possible that separates us from smaller prefixes, we can check whether or not the gap is in the list of words. And if that's the case, then we can just add to the dp value of our prefix, the dp value of uh, the previous uh, prefix, so of the smaller prefix, which has length prefix len minus gap len. In the end, the dp value is computed correctly for every prefix, including the one corresponding to the entire string. So we can now print it. Yes. Before submitting this code, there's two issues we need to fix. The first one is related to duplicates. Um, so up until that point, we always assume that words are unique in our dictionary, but uh, two or more words may have the same decoding in Morse. That's the case for um, word cat and text, which have the exact same sequence of dots and dashes. Fixing this bug in our code is pretty easy because now instead of just adding to the dp value of our prefix, the dp value of the smaller prefix, we can also multiply that by the number of words that match the decoding of the gap. And so this way, we are now fixing that problem. So now our code is passing all test cases except this one, which is too slow. Our code doesn't complete. The test case with same encoding for different words now is passing and the one with many possibilities. But we have an issue related to performance because our code is uh, too slow and we have to improve it. The first optimization we can do for this source code is to use now a counter instead of a list to store the words. Then instead of doing a linear search for the number of occurrences of the gap inside the list of words, now we can do a constant time lookup inside of the counter, which is a dictionary. So now, as you can see, I've imported collections, which allows us to use the counter object. And then we'll just increase by one the count of the encoding of the word as soon as we get it. And then instead of telling to look up for the count, we just take the value corresponding to that key. And now that's one first improvement. Let's see if the test case pass. And well, it's still too slow, but there's another thing we can do. The other optimization we can perform is related to the size of the words that are provided. Here in the constraints, it's said that uh, each word has a maximum length of M and here M is never more than 90. So we are always guaranteed that valid gap will be small. Uh, to be precise, it will never be more than 76 characters, which is a 19 times four, four uh, being the maximum length of a Morse character. So in our code, we will never have to check gaps that are larger than 76 characters. So we can just modify that. And so now instead of having a loop over all lengths, up till prefix len, we will stop at 76 when that's the case. Now we can run the test cases again. And now you can see the long sequence finally passes. And so all test cases are green. So now I can finally submit this code and enjoy my full 100% of this um, puzzle. I hope that you're now able to understand dynamic programming better and that you remember the difference between top down and bottom up. If you want to practice, I leave um, in the video description a link to this coding and puzzle that we just did. And you can try to implement the solution, but in a top down way this time. Remember the top down way uses the exact same principle for building solutions, but it's based on the recursive calls and caching to start from the bigger problem and working your way down to the smaller ones. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.